Trevor here, and today I illustrate for you from the SCP Foundation Vaults. Item number SCP-158. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-158 is installed in Operating Theater 7 in Bio Research Area 12. Personnel are not allowed in, nor is power to be supplied to the room unless they have an approved clearance requisition form to the Chief of Research. Personnel wishing to use the device must request and have read the instruction manual in full. During the device's use, two armed guards are to remain on standby outside of the room at all times. In the event of an accident, all power must be cut to the room instantly, and the guards are to examine the room carefully for any signs of misconduct. Misconduct will be punished in a manner decided by the Chief of Research on a case-by-case -case basis. Description. SCP-158 is a large mechanical arm similar to those found in automotive factories, although the end attachment is unusually shaped resembling a pointed tridactyl claw. Its optimal placement is to be installed and suspended upside down, its base attached to the ceiling. A series of cables are protruding from the base. Some are connected to a complex mobile console complete with a visual display unit and full keyboard. The others should be connected to a working power supply if the device is to be operated successfully. At the bottom of the console, there is a dispensing device with attachments for a container roughly 7.6 cm in width and 17.8 cm in height. The arm, cables, and console have sustained fire damage, but this is purely cosmetic and does not affect the device's performance. When activated, the device will take 20 minutes to boot up and become fully functional. When used correctly on a living organism that displays cognition, SCP-158 will remove an unknown substance and transfer it through the dispensing device beneath the console. The optimum container for this substance is a glass jar or beaker that fits the attachment. After this action is performed, the organism that it was performed on will cease all higher brain functions, with only the activity in the brainstem continuing. The subject will not respond to external stimuli and will not exhibit any movement beyond basic reflex actions. The substance removed is gaseous, though its overall appearance and properties differ from subject to subject. The substance is an indefinite source of kinetic, electrical, heat, and light energy, although the rate and output, again, differ from subject to subject. The average is relatively low. The device was found in late 2007 within a burned hospital that had been in apparent disuse for an unknown period of time. Along with the device was a badly damaged operator's manual which contained instructions on how to use the device. These instructions have since been transcribed and copied numerous times, with a single copy always present in the containment room. While the instructions clearly state how to maintain and use the device, the chapters chronicling who built it and what exactly it did were too badly damaged to be read requiring a process of trial and error to find out. See Experiment Log 158-AA. Experiment Log 158-AA was ran by Dr. Heinrich Dreisch, a medical researcher assigned to SCP-158. The exact dates are redacted, but the experiments were run in 2008. Here are the audio logs that remain on file. Experiment 1. The device worked perfectly. It seems the damage to its casing was merely cosmetic, but more interesting was the substance extracted from Subject 1A. It's dark brown in color, and is some strange cross between liquid and a gaseous state. It should be analyzed in around an hour. Attempts to get the subject to show any sort of brain activity since has, as of yet, met with no progress. Still, no great loss there. Experiment 2 This time, the substance was a light blue, and it seems more active than the previous one. I wonder if it had anything to do with the difference in age. Experiment 3 the test results came back, but they were inconclusive. They couldn't find anything. Literally. There were no signs that the substance even existed apart from the steady emitting of light and heat. Anything else? Nothing. Again, the subject has produced another different sample, different in color, and in energy output. This is all quite odd. Experiment 6 There was a slight accident involving my assistant, Lucy. I'm not sure how she managed it, but she knocked the sample from Subject 6B onto her laptop. The strange part is that it was out of power beforehand, now it's running, despite the fact that both the plug and battery have been removed. 
However, there are some irregularities in his actions, small glitches, nothing serious. It does make me wonder. Experiment 11. This is the last one for the night. This sample is different, just like all the rest, but I've been noticing some semblance of a pattern to it. After a few more experiments tomorrow, I believe I'll be able to elaborate. None of the subjects extracted from today have come out of the vegetative state. There's physically nothing wrong with them, nothing at all. I've had them screened for every possible medical anomaly. They're just not there. Lights are on, but nobody's home. Still, despite this, I'm keeping them restrained and under guard along with Lucy's laptop, just in case. With the kinds of things that go on around here, it's better safe than sorry. Experiment 24. I was right. There's a pattern to it. I'm almost certain the irregularities in energy output are caused by the subject's age and vitality. As for the difference in colors, I think it may be down to the subject's disposition, but I'm not sure. I need to run a couple more tests and get the original files on the subjects. Lucy's laptop is still running, despite not actually having proper power supply for two days. There's no trace of the substance, internal or external. There's not even a mark on the casing. The irregularities are strange too. If left idle on a word processor, text will write itself, but it's gibberish. Still, it's an experiment that warrants some investigation. Experiment 27. I've tried putting the substance obtained from subjects into a variety of mechanical and electronic devices. The results are surprising. All of them have begun to work independently of an external power source. The ones of an electrical nature exhibit slight glitches of an intermittent nature. The mechanical items worked far more smoothly, although there was still the occasional oddity. The experimentation on my subjects continue. The research approval will most likely end when we get through around 50 or so. Experiment 45. The substances implanted in the objects have proven to be able to be removed using the machine. When they were extracted, they were exactly the same as before. We could use these as a type of infinite energy, but we'd have to find a way past the consistent discrepancies and glitches. I've left the original one in Lucy's computer, and the glitches seem to be getting more frequent and more specific. Now it opens the word processor itself and types coherent sentences. I've saved them all to a file for research purposes. The camera and microphone activate themselves and try to remain on regardless of attempts to turn them off. We continued to close the programs and the word processor opened and typed out the words, quit it, you asshole. I'm submitting it for a Turing test. Experiment 49. The laptop passed the test and it has displayed characteristics similar to subject 6B, the original donor. Although the subject states that it has no memory of time spent in the laptop, this does confirm my suspicions. Against all logic and reasoning, SCP-158 is a device that extracts what most people would term a soul. Unfortunately, my research is being stopped for the time being. I think I can make a strong case for the continuation of research into SCP-158. That ends the audio files for experiment log 158-AA. Dr. Dreich was soon after promoted to the head of studies regarding SCP-158. Further experimentation on SCP-158 and its products will continue. Additional notes. The device is also capable of reversing the extraction, placing the same or a different substance back into the subject. See experiment log 158-AG. When this action is performed, the subject will regain all cognitive and higher brain functions, but the total results differ depending on whether or not it was the original substance extracted from the patient that was replaced. Here there are additional audio files from Experiment Log 158-AG ran by Professor K.P. Crow regarding SCP-158 in the use for the Olympia project. These experiments were also run in 2008. Pre-experiment note. I've gathered up several D-Class personnel, having interviewed and evaluated them all, and picked the ones with personalities and characteristics that I like or deem useful. Some are male, others are female, as I believe the soul transcends the flesh in which it is confined. But the purpose of this experiment is to test the extra capabilities of the device, those spoken upon in the heavily damaged section of the operator's manual. 
I pored over them incessantly, trying to glean as much information as possible from it, but the instructions I managed to get were sketchy at best and downright unhelpful at worst. But that won't deter me. I am a researcher, after all. Experiment 1 I withdrew the first subject sold today. Try as I might, I was unable to do anything extra to it, but then again, there was such a small window of time for me to utilize and try everything. But on the bright side, I managed to reverse the process. While that had been done before, no one has discovered the sequence needed to activate it. They've only been operating on blind luck. This is the first thing I will concentrate on. Experiment 5 <laughs> I've done it. It wasn't that hard. Experiment 6 You know, I've noticed there's a small period in the middle of the operation where the process pauses, as if it was waiting for further commands. I think that's when further inputs can be made. I'll have to start checking. Experiment 7 I've been removing and re-implanting the same soul in the same test subject, mainly as a form of experimentation with controls, but also as practice. Oddly enough, there doesn't seem to be any sort of side effects regarding the subject's health. One would think there would be, considering what I'm doing to her. <laughs> Regardless, I've been probing around that pause with the controls, and I think I almost have it. Experiment 8 I made it begin the movements of something else entirely before it paused again and resumed its original course. I think I almost got it. Experiment 11 I got it! It completely stopped during the pause, and a completely new set of operations appeared on the monitor, being things like split, merge, remove aspects, add aspects, and combine aspects. From this, I can only deduce that the device is capable of internally storing and modifying these souls for the use on other subjects. This is exactly what I was looking for. Experiment 12 The aspects that the machine talks about are difficult to define properly. They're all notated by a single word each, often something obscure from various religious texts. I've had to pour over the holy books of at least four major religions and six minor ones, just to understand what the hell the machine is trying to tell me. And even then, I'm still not entirely sure I understand. As far as I know it, most of these aspects are the facets of a person's personality and their general behavior, as well as things like willpower, understanding, conscious, creativity, empathy, drive. Uh, this may take some time to truly figure out. Experiment 37. This is taking much, much longer than I originally anticipated. So far, I've discovered that the device itself can store up to 10 different souls and their composite aspects and modify them internally. Finding out exactly what each aspect corresponds with is difficult to say the least. I'm having to modify each subject slightly, then send them out for a complete psychological evaluation to try and discern what exactly I did. Then, I have to repeat the process several more times just to make sure. It's tiring to say the least, but on the upside, I am becoming more proficient at the device. Experiment 42 oh, This is getting ridiculous. This has sucked up most of the time in my day and I'm near falling asleep here. There has to be a different way to monitor or measure the changes in these people's souls. I'm going to try and get onto some R&D and see if they can find some sort of way to reverse engineer some part of this device. Something to make this run just a little bit smoother, and maybe something that can help me understand it more. I know how to operate it, but I'm shooting in the dark here. I'm like a child with a piano. I know which keys make the sound, but I can't play a song to save my life. I'll try again tomorrow. Maybe the morning will bring with it new ideas. Experiment 57 I had thought I had grasped an idea of the limits of this device, but I was proven wrong. I had assumed the machine was at fault, being too complicated for its own good. Now I realize my mistake. It's not the machine, it's the very nature of the human soul. There's no true way to express something like that in mere words, although this machine desperately tries to do it. That said, it will take me some time to be able to use this device competently enough to do what I'm hoping to do. I'll have to study the things I've seen and recorded to the very limits of my ability. Experiment 80 I've left the device alone for the moment, electing to study my notes rather than raise more questions interacting with the device. 
I recorded over 400 different words in regards to the aspects with an almost unlimited number of combinations capable therein. It seems apt, of course, considering the complexity of the human condition, but should I master this device, the possibilities could be endless. Such a thing does not seem to be anywhere in sight. It may take months, even years, simply to grasp this device, let alone do what I have suggested. But I plan to do it in days. Experiment 93. Still no real progress. At most, I've gotten a single soul that is a composite of all I've learned. But it's something that I can't quite describe. When entered into a host, it's highly interesting. But when I send it in for a psych test, the results basically go out the window. We can't get a valid test result, which in and of itself is impossible. Experiment 95. I've been modifying this composite soul, which I'll dub subject zero for the time being. And every time I do so, I get the feeling there's more to this than meets the eye. It seems to be more aware of its surroundings and more knowledgeable than its host should allow, displaying an intellect that would outstrip most researchers in this place many times over. Possibly even me. Experiment 107 My god, this is unprecedented. The reason why the evaluations were so inconclusive, why Zero seemed so knowledgeable, why it seemed to be able to see another world around it, they all make sense now. Subject Zero, by some fluke of chance or by my meddling with this machine somehow, simultaneously exists in this plane of existence and several others. I've created an entity that exists beyond the scope of human interaction. A consciousness that can see, hear, feel, and think outside of this realm. It is aware of what I'm doing, and it appreciates me for having created it. It is, in a sense, immortal. Even if its physical host is destroyed, it is capable of continuing to survive beyond that, only slightly limited in its level of existence. It revealed the truth to me, and I have asked it to answer my questions for the evaluation honestly. It agreed. Experiment 110 Zero would make an excellent candidate for my assistant. It respects and admires me for its creation, much as a child would an endearing father figure. I have assured it that it would be treated well and that I would give it a host to the best of my ability to create. All that it asks of me is that it is given a name other than Zero. A name, not a number. I told it to give itself a name, to christen itself whatever it so wishes. It told me it would have to think about it. End of session. The experiment log notes indicate that the composite soul has been accepted as a component for the Olympia project. Addendum 01. Dr. Redacted suggests experimentation with D-Class personnel and electronic equipment to attempt to reproduce SCP-168, SCP-1875, SCP-2306, or similar phenomena. This action is pending. Addendum 1A. Inspired by the previous addendum, Regulator Redacted has hit on the ingenious notion of using SCP-158 on a test subject, then exposing the body to SCP-217 until the virus has run its course, and finally re-injecting the contest back into the transmogrified body. Redacted and Redacted are extremely excited about this proposal and have arranged a meeting with all 12 of the redacted to discuss the far-reaching benefits of such a technique. That concludes the file for SCP-158. I hope you've enjoyed this illustration and narration. If you have an SCP or a short story that you'd like to see narrated and illustrated, let me know in the comments below. Hit that like and subscribe button and I'll see you next time.